This week, SpaceX landed yet another Falcon 9 booster and also finally <laughs> short hopped a Starship prototype. How do they manage to do what until only recently was science fiction? Hey y'all, this is Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. Make sure you like and subscribe, and definitely make sure you ask questions in the comments or at my email address. Also, when we hit 500 subscribers, we are going to do a giveaway, so definitely make sure you subscribe there so you know what's coming up and you know when the giveaway happens. So, as most space fans know, SpaceX is the first company or first entity actually to propulsively land a booster from an orbital speed. Now Blue Origin beat them to the punch by just a little bit, but they're kind of doing up and down hops. I'm not taking anything away from how complicated that is and, and was, but certainly SpaceX is the ones who have gotten the most attention from the media because they're doing it incredibly difficultly because they're actually bringing it back from space. The space shuttle, as some people might think, like, well, wait, they reused things, they brought them back from space, but they were fundamentally different. The solid rocket boosters on the sides of the space shuttle actually went up and opened up parachutes after they stopped and fell back into the ocean and were fished out, kind of like SpaceX is doing with their fairings right now, <laughs> although I know they're trying to catch them, but most of the time they seem to fetch them out of the water. And then the space shuttle itself was just a giant flying brick that came in from space and landed more or less like an airplane or like a glider or something like that. So not the same thing at all. And also it was human controlled. The SpaceX booster is completely autonomously controlled. There's no human being driving it. And quite honestly, it would probably also be about impossible for a human being to learn how to do it. Their reaction time would just have to be too fast and too precise. So how do they do it? They, there are several components to this. Number one is autonomy, of course. It has to do it itself. Second is inertial guidance, which means that it has to know where it is in space, basically above the Earth. Third is GPS, which actually helps with inertial guidance for it to determine where it is. Fourth is control systems, which means that it's actually the way that it controls the rocket itself and all the pieces. Fifth is computer vision. And sixth is AI training and logic and algorithms like convex optimization algorithms and so forth to help it actually figure out what to do. So we're going to break this down. This was too long of an episode to do in one episode. I just felt like it would be too long. So I'm going to break this down. In this episode, I'm going to kind of talk about the history and the way a rocket launches and then what's different about a launch versus a landing. So certainly launches have been done since, let's say, the 1940s, at least with control. Um, the, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it was the Nazis who developed that, Werner von Braun. Uh, he, he, the, the V2 rocket was actually had a rudimentary control system on it. So it was able to take off. It was able to keep going straight up. It was able to even target more or less where it was supposed to go. So all of that stuff has been around for a long time. Of course, massively refined over the years. By the time we get to the 1960s and Gemini and Apollo, they have computer systems on board. They have a lot of stuff that's going on. They have this massive control systems. I actually did a video on this which you can check out up here on the flight systems and computers that were on board the Apollo. With both launch and landing, the entire sequence has to be done autonomously. There is no time for data to go back to the ground, for computations to be done, and for it to be re-uploaded to the flight computer on board. Uh, also, there could be data dropouts at any point due to the fact that there could be a loss of signal or something. So there's all sorts of problems with that. So basically, the computers on board, even from the get-go with Gemini and Apollo, had to do all of this themselves. So the next topic after autonomy is inertial guidance. Inertial guidance is a control system that basically says it's a little kind of ball of gyroscopes. And it, it knows where it is, and it knows from takeoff how much time has gone by and how much acceleration it's had and how much rotation in each of the three dimensions it's had and so it's able to figure out fairly closely exactly where it is this of course was borrowed from the autopilot systems of the 1950s that were developed for airplanes to be able to use autopilot of course this was developed and turned into a much more robust system in the space industry this traditionally, of course, has only been used to launch vehicles, however. Now, this is a very daunting task. I'm not taking anything away from people with slide rules who had to figure all this stuff out. And, of course, very primitive computers. But you could pretty much pre-program everything into a launch sequence. So you could do all the heavy lifting computing on the ground 
upload it into the flight computer and then it would just it would say at 2.5 seconds do this at 13.7 seconds do this right so it had an exact sequence like a recipe that it followed that made things much much easier for a launch sequence than for a landing sequence of course for landing sequences now with the GPS system in, involved, SpaceX does use the GPS system to locate both the rocket and the landing pad. Now, you may ask about the landing pad, but if it's on the ocean on a drone ship, it can easily be moving around. So it needs to locate that. So it can locate pretty darn precisely exactly where the rocket is and exactly where the landing pad is. So GPS is actually crucially important. I gather in the later stages of the landing that there is also computer vision involved where it's actually looking down and it's seeing the landing target and so it can also adjust itself based on computer vision. As far as control systems are concerned for landing, there are actually three primary control systems. There is the main rocket engines, either one or three of them that are ignited. Uh, they gimbal, which means that they actually turn on a base, which means that they can actually control the exact direction of the entire rocket. It's pretty crazy. I mean, if you've ever tried to balance like a broom on your fingertip, you're trying to balance something with a center of mass way, way above you like this, right? So basically that's what's happening with the rocket gimbling. It's, it's keeping the whole thing upright from the bottom, which is kind of a crazy system. In order to help it with that, there are also thrusters on the bottom and on the top of the rocket which shoot out cold gas, which can actually move the rocket around a little bit and actually rotate it as well. And then there are grid fins, which are cool, like they used to be made out of aluminum, I think, and now they're titanium. But they pop out and they like shift around and so they can spin it and they can rotate the rocket. So there are a whole bunch of control systems that allow control over the rocket as, well, It's when it's being launched, the gimbling system, of course, is critically important. But as it's landing, those other two systems come into play. There's also an inertial measurement unit or IMU which you're probably familiar with with your phone now right if you turn your camera from horizontal to vertical that's a very simple IMU that's actually telling it that it's upright as opposed to sideways changes the orientation of your um, of your picture and so forth right and so you can do a lot of stuff with IMUs as well so between the GPS and the IMU and the flight control systems and everything it has a very very precise knowledge of where it is. So for landing you have to have reactivity and flexibility so it needs to the algorithms need to be able to react to what's going on and they also need to be flexible enough to deal with things going out of scope right a little unexpected stuff within some margin of error and also perhaps noisy data that is a huge problem as you're getting this information, it may be coming to you and you may get a buffet by a little bit of wind or something and it may knock it out or some data may come through wrong or there may seem be some electrical problems. So noisy data is an, a very important thing to deal with. So there has to be flexibility in the algorithm to deal with noisy data and also to deal with being out of scope a little bit. Let's talk about the steps for landing. Okay, so this is specifically SpaceX and uh, other rocket companies. If they get there, then we'll talk about them. So the first thing that happens is there's, there's two stages on a SpaceX Falcon 9. The first stage stops firing its engine on launch and then separates from the second stage. The second stage then lights its engine and takes off. So the first stage is a ballistic object at this point. It's going up and it's going to come back down again. And so the first thing that has to happen is that it has to open its grid fins um, this is usually done early. It doesn't actually have to do this till it gets back in the atmosphere. It's actually in space when it cuts off, but it does this normally, at least from what I've seen, it does this immediately so that I guess they're ready for when it gets back into the atmosphere. If it needs to do a boost back burn, it does one. This was much more popular, I guess, for the uh, Falcon 9 back in the day. It doesn't seem like they land things on shore too much anymore. They seem to, for the most part, land on the barges now, which saves them gas, fuel. <laughs> anyway, as they're going up propellant, I should say, honestly, because it's oxygen and uh, RP1. So anyway, so it's, sorry, propellant is the precise term. But anyway, as it's going up, if it has to go back to Cape Canaveral, or to Vandenberg, it needs to do a boost back burn, which means it needs to stop itself in its horizontal motion and start back this way. All the while it's falling, right? It's going up and then it's falling, but it goes this way. But we'll just deal with a ballistic arc that goes like this and it lands where it lands. So the drone ship has been placed exactly where it's supposed to be so that this ballistic arc will allow it to go there. So anyway, the grid fins open. If it needs to do a boost back burn, it does a boost back burn. At a predetermined point of altitude and velocity, 
it aims its rocket engines downward, and then it uses three engines to do what's called an entry burn, which is essential for two reasons. Number one, it has to scrub some speed, because otherwise it's just screaming back. And number two, it has to reduce the amount of heat on the uh, on the booster as it's entering the atmosphere because what happens is that rocket plume actually creates a little bit of kind of a bow shock a little bit of a cushion so that the atmosphere as it's coming up uh, well as the rocket is coming down and hitting the atmosphere and heating it it's being pushed out of the way by the rocket flames so it keeps the booster relatively cool I mean when you see it when it comes back it's all cooked anyway but it's less cooked than it would be it would be it would be explosively cooked otherwise um, so anyway it's doing that boost back burn also to scrub speed because it's got to get down to some reasonable amount of speed everything up until this point can probably be pretty much pre-programmed in because you're out of the atmosphere it's doing things that it knows it's already in an expected location within a pretty narrow margin so probably all of this can be done relatively pre-programmed and straightforwardly after this comes the fun <laughs> right so the re-entry burn is at the top of the atmosphere when it's coming in then after that, it has to start dealing with the fact that it needs to start moving its grid fins around. Before that, it's been using the cold grass thrusters to keep itself upright and then gimbling the rocket engines as it actually lights them. But that's only like 20 seconds or something. It's a very short time. So for the most part, it's been using the cold gas thrusters to keep itself in line. But as it gets into thicker atmosphere, it becomes more efficient to use these grid fins because there's supersonic air going through them. So it's extremely, they have a lot of control authority. I think that's what it's called. Control authority. So anyway, they can make a lot of adjustments to the rocket. Also, they are, if you think about like a dart, suddenly this thing becomes a dart. So you've got the bottom of the rocket, the center of mass, and then the center of friction is above that. So now it becomes dynamically stable. So you don't have to use fuel. You don't have to use thrusters. So that's an extra good point. So not only can these grid fins control where it's going, but they can keep it dynamically stable. So the grid fins keep the booster oriented, but they also start to aim it towards the drone ship. And you may think like, wait, why don't you just aim at that to start with? Um, there's a big safety reason involved, well, actually also an expense reason, and that is if the whole thing kind of failed, the idea is that, let's say you have your drone ship here, it's going to come in and land in the water relatively close by, but it won't hit the drone ship, which means if it explodes on the ocean, it explodes on the ocean. Um, it's a lot cheaper than replacing a drone ship or part of a drone ship when it explodes on the drone ship. So, so the idea is that it comes in and then the grid fins cause it to kind of like do this slide across towards the end as it knows that it's doing pretty well and it kind of slides across and it gets real close and then at the very end it like boosts itself the last little bit over so it's directly over the landing pad. So now between the IMU, the timer, and the GPS, the rocket knows approximately where it is, it knows where the landing pad is and it's getting close and on the final approach it does what's called a suicide burn and it's called a suicide burn because this rocket is mostly empty and even just lighting one single engine has more thrust than the weight of the rocket. In other words, if this was sitting on the launching pad with that amount of fuel in it and you lit that one rocket engine up, it would go up in the air. So you can't light this thing too early and just do this cool little hover. I don't know if you've ever seen the Blue Origin one, but it kind of comes down, it goes like, and it kind of hovers and it comes back down. You can't do that with this Falcon 9. The rocket engines are just too powerful for the empty um, rocket booster. It weighs too little. So during this burn, the grid fins can help at the start, but by the end, it's really just the gimbling of the Falcon 9 rocket that's coming down that's controlling it. It has to gimbal itself. It has to get in position. It shoots out the cold gas thrusters to keep it upright. And then it's just screaming down at an incredible, incredible speed. And it comes down and it just goes boop and it just touches. And exactly when it touches, it should be doing just a little bit less than zero. So right, it's going just a little bit down a few meters per second. And then the engine has to cut off like that. If it doesn't, it's going to take back off again and who knows where it'll go. <laughs> so this is an incredibly complicated thing. The last piece of the landing is the part that's the really, really hard part and requires a lot of stuff to go right. So that's the landing sequence. And AI has to be used on the final burn portion, especially to train the system to 
understand how to do exactly the right sequence of things to keep itself upright, to come down, to land with almost zero velocity, to turn off the motor at the right time, etc., etc., etc. You can also see this happening in the Starship prototype that was just launched recently. It does a 150 meter hop, and here they've got enough weight on this thing that actually the entire thing can hover. So you can see how differently it behaves. The Falcon 9 comes screaming down and just comes to a stop right at the exact right moment. It'd be like I don't know. <laughs> in, in, in a simpler fashion, I guess, it'd be like taking a boat and coming in, spinning the boat around, right? You're coming in full speed towards the dock. You spin the boat around. And as you get there, you fire up the, the motor and you have to stop exactly when you touch the dock. That's how complicated it is, except way, way more complicated than that. Because <laughs> you're dealing with three dimensions and you're dealing with air instead of water. So it's much less forgiving. But anyway, you can see how the Starship itself can hover, but it's got the exact same sequence of things. It knows where it is from the IMU. It has an engine gimbling system. It's got cold gas thrusters. It doesn't need grid fins yet because it's not up in the atmosphere, so it's not doing those same things. But the whole landing sequence is pretty much the same, but of course a lot more forgiving because of the fact that it's allowed, it's able to hover. You can also see that with the grasshopper prototype that SpaceX practiced their landings with. It was able to go up, hover, move around, and come back down again. So they are practicing on setups that allow them to be to have a lot more room for error when it comes to falcon 9 landings they have to be exactly dead on which is why it's such a kind of miracle that it happens hopefully you enjoyed this episode and hopefully this whets your appetite for episode two where we're going to talk specifically about how artificial intelligence ai is used to allow these rocket ships to land so exactly on the pad when they get there. Definitely make sure you like and subscribe so you can get more of this and definitely see episode two. And also so you can be involved in our giveaway when we hit 500 subscribers. Also, please be sure to ask questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.